Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Goodnow, the concert coordinator here at United Methodist Church of Sun City Center. And on behalf of our senior pastor, Dr. Charles Rents, and the whole staff here, welcome. This is our second Organ Plus Artist concert in the series that we have. And today you're going to hear our own church organist, Keith Rasmussen. And his guest artist today will be trumpeter Jerry Bell. And we'll get to that in a moment. I want to thank you for those of you that tuned in Friday night to the Kenny Evans concert. It was a great concert. So this Organ Plus series is on the third Sunday of each month. Last month we started it with Keith and our own worship and arts director, Jeff Jordan. He was playing piano. So today is the second in the series, and we welcome you to that. This is our gift to the community. And coming up in March, we're going to have two organists uniting for a concert. Keith will be here as well. And then we're going to have an organist by the name of Frank Perko III, who's out of the Miami area. And they're going to give a great concert. And the date of that is going to be Sunday, March 21st. In the meantime, we do have some Friday night concerts coming up as well, and I want to make you aware of those. Next Friday night on the 26th, we have a gospel family coming from Ohio. They're the Morse Family Gospel Singers. This is a family of eight people that will be performing, mom and dad and six of their eight children, and they will be here live performing, and that'll be, ne that'll be next Friday night at 7 o'clock. So we hope you tune in for that as well. Before we get started, uh, I'd like to let you know that we are, are open for Sunday church services, even though we haven't opened for concerts or other events. And our church services on Sunday morning are at 8.30, 9.45, and 11 o'clock. The 8.30 and the 11 o'clock service are the traditional services right here in the sanctuary. And then at 9.45, we have the contemporary service across the uh, breezeway here in our LEC building. So we'd love to have you come worship with us live on Sunday morning, and we, we would uh, hope you would get a blessing from that. So before we do any concert, we always like to have a prayer. It's uh, our tradition to do that. So if you can bow your heads for just a moment with me, please. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this Sunday that we enjoy. We also thank you for this music that we will be hearing today from the organ and from the trumpet. We know that music is a gift from you, God, and we just thank you for that. And we pray that this music that we'll hear this afternoon will be pleasing to you. We just thank you for all your love, your mercy, and your grace. And most of all, we thank you for the greatest gift of all, the gift of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, if you've tuned in to these organ concerts that we used to do on Wednesday afternoon, you know a little bit about Keith uh, and the monster that he is on the organ. So you may not know more about Jerry Bell, though. He's a local trumpeter. And he's actually played in some of our Sunday morning services with us. He's got an extensive career playing not only for a number of uh, community concert bands, but also big stage bands. And he is currently the bugler for the Valencia Lakes Military Veterans Club and is a member of the performing brass ensemble Florida Brass. Jerry also has a solo act that he takes out into the community called Jer's Canned Jam. And he's entertained audiences at various VFWs and legions in the Tampa Bay area under that act. So again, we welcome you to this concert. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and a great organist, Keith Rasmussen. Thank you, Kevin. We'd like to welcome you all to our concert this afternoon. I should mention that Jerry and I have worked together quite a bit in the past. Um, we worked at a couple neighboring churches, and the first time I met him, we'd advertised in that particular church for brass players. And he showed up with four trumpets. Not one, not two, not three, but four. Now, he has not yet chosen to play them all at once. He only has two hands, after all. But he handles each one well, um, and 
plays the music that fits each trumpet best. More to be continued. I asked Jerry to give me a little bit of information about the background of the trumpet, and this is kind of a synopsis of what he gave me. Trumpets are referenced throughout Scripture. They're a call to action, a call to war, a call to march, or a call to assemble. Both the Old and the New Testaments, there are many references to the sound of the trumpet. First Corinthians, the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. In Psalms, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. The trumpet as we know it started appearing in the 1400s. Most were pitched in the key of B flat. If you stretch out all the tubing, of an instrument like that it would measure about five and a half feet and would be played in concert B flat. Most early trumpets were straight instruments and did not have valves. Back in 1770 the bell of the trumpet was curved such that it was easier for the player's hand to reach the bell similar to French horns and I'll just add to Jerry's wonderful synopsis here that many trumpet players to, to play in different keys would bring along crooks or different slides that they would stop and slide into their trumpet so they could play in a different key. Um, the crook and the trumpet, I'm not sure how that works together. I'll let you figure that out. But they were not able to change key without changing a tube. In 1778, Charles Clogart of France included rotary valves to the trumpet, somewhat like the French horn. In 1839, Francois Pertinet created the first piston valve trumpet, the most commonly used trumpet today. The valves make the trumpet chromatic, that is it can produce half notes and whole steps, half steps and whole steps, required in any musical score or chromatic scale. The first factory to produce trumpets was founded in Paris, France, where French basson, B-E-S-S-O-N, trumpets continue to be produced. Today, the most popular trumpet is the B-flat trumpet. The keyed trumpets are produced in D, E-flat, C, and G, all with three valves and tuned to the instrument pitch by varying the internal length of the instrument. The B-flat trumpet has a sister instrument, the B-flat flugelhorn. Same pitch, same valve arrangement, but a different tone. Because the flugelhorn is made shorter and bigger diameter tubing, a much larger bell produces a much deeper, richer, mellow tone versus its sister trumpet. Today's program will feature using the D trumpet, the high one, and the flugelhorn. You'll notice the size of the bell is much larger on the flugelhorn. The first piece that we're dealing with today is the trumpet tune by Stanley. Stanley lived from 1712 to 1786. He had an accident at two where he was almost blinded. He was educated early and received many honors. He became organist of the Society of the Inner Temple for the, and played there the rest of his life. And this is related to the Knights Templar. He attracted many musicians to hear him, including the great Handel, who was a friend of his. Stanley conducted many oratorios. Well, how would he do that if he was blind? Believe it or not, and I've read this several times, so I believe it's true, he would have somebody play it through for him one time, and then he would conduct from memory. Try that sometime. After Handel's death in 1759, um, Stanley took over the leadership of Handel's oratorios, and he composed some himself. He conducted the annual Messiah, at Foundling Hospital, which Handel had conducted for every year. The piece we're going to hear today is a voluntary, which is not really a 
piece or a, a title that means too much to us, what it means is it's a piece for the organ played on the trumpet stop. Today it's played with Jerry's D trumpet. And this is the trumpet tune in D by Stanley. first organ piece today is a Symphonia in D by Bach from Cantata number 29. I can't believe it was 40 years ago. I know I don't even look that old, but 40 years ago we installed a Rogers organ with pipes, an earlier version of this, a Rogers 350, and I played this piece on our first recital. It was one of the first pieces that I learned after I graduated with my master's in organ, and it is tricky. I think I almost have it now, but every so often it still fools me. Um, if you listen to a recording of this, it's done with a Baroque orchestra of strings, woodwinds, and trumpets, and organ. It's, very, it's driving and exciting. Um, I've registered it today, so the, there's a rise and fall of dynamics. It starts fairly big, it gets softer, louder, softer, and then ends with just a thrilling crescendo at the end. This was a piece that Virgil Fox and many other concert artists have played over the years. And in one recital where Virgil played this, 
um, he went to the console and spoke without a mic, but you could hear him kind of in the distance. He said that this piece had been composed by Bach to celebrate the local elections where they had thrown out all the old um, officials and brought in the new ones. And Virgil suggested they do it again. And I don't know what year that would have been, but it makes for a really good story. Please enjoy the Symphonia in D by Bach from Cantata 29.
One of the things that I enjoy from doing this series is doing the research. And many of you have emailed and said that you enjoyed learning more about the pieces. You can always say, now that sounds nice or that doesn't sound nice. But learning something about it, I think, is very helpful. And it, it's good for my intellectual understanding of what I'm doing. The next piece with trumpet is the air by, by Handel. And there's quite a story behind this. Handel, was, when he was a young man, he studied in Germany. He went to Italy for a time, and much of his violin technique um, is representative of the Italian Baroque at that time. He came back to Germany. Um, he graduated from school, basically, and he was employed by the Elector of Saxony. Well, Handel took leave and visited England and overstayed his leave. He came back and he made things right with the elector until he left again and never returned. Guess who the next king of England was? It was a German king called the Elector of Saxony. Believe it or not, the story is told that Handel was not in favor at the king's court. We can only imagine why. It was typical at that time for the king's court to go out on the River Thames on a barge and probably pulled by horses on the bank. And beside the king's barge would be a barge with musicians on it who would play for the king's enjoyment. Well, Handel composed the water music, which was played during this trip, the music was found to be so favorable that Handel was again in favor with the court. Funny how that worked. So the air um, from water music by Handel on the flugelhorn. <laughs>
Our next piece with trumpet is Let the Bright Seraphim. This comes from the oratorio, Samson, which he was composing at the same time he was composing Messiah. No wonder he was busy. The text for Samson was taken from Milton's poetry. Brilliant arias at this time with trumpet were very common. Consider the trumpet shall sound from Messiah. This is sung at the very end of the Samson opera by an anonymous Israelitish woman. And it summons the celestial hosts to hail the dead hero. It's a wonderful piece. Jerry plays it beautifully. Let the bright seraphim by Handel. <laughs> is the Pavan by Elmore. Elmore lived from 1913 to 1985. He was actually born in India. He was known as an organ virtuoso, a teacher, and composer. He studied with Pietro Jan from St. Patrick's Cathedral, who was a former organist at St. Peter's in Rome. The pavan, by definition, is a stately dance in duple time, popular in 16th and 17th centuries. This is from the rhythmic suite. It's a very listenable 20th century work. It was composed in, or published in 1954. And you'll notice it doesn't sound quite like anything that I've played before. But Richard Purvis used to play this at Grace Cathedral, and he had a knack for choosing pieces that people would enjoy. And I play this piece um, in my practice sessions, and my colleague Jeff Jordan will come up, and he has a tremendous background in theory, and he'll say, now what is that, what, what's that harmony from? Well, this was 1954. It has a lot of kind of unresolved chords and rhythmic structures in the pedal, it uses some very, very colorful solo stops 
and ends with a, the French horn um, in front of quiet strings and ends an almost inaudible sound. So, enjoy the Pavan by Elmore. <laughs> Our next piece is the well-known Holy City by Adam. This was a Victorian ballad um, published in 1892, and I learned a very amazing story in my research from this, and I'll share it with you. Um, the writer was Michael Maybrick, M-A-Y-B-R-I-C-K. Stephen Adams was his pen name. The text was written by Frederick Weatherly. This was commercially extremely successful and also vastly pirated. 
I have a book of the Holy City in every key for soloist, for piano, for organ. Um, one of about four books I have. Another one is Ave Maria, um, the Lord's Prayer. Um, so this is very, very common and much appreciated. And I, I would digress to say when I was a little boy practicing my half hour of penance, I mean piano practice a day, um, I hated my pieces. So when I would finish practicing, I would pull out anything I could find out of the piano bench. The first one I found was the Holy City in A flat. I couldn't play the arpeggios, but I could learn the chords. As I progressed, I, mean, I was able to play it all. Then my mother was conducting the elementary school choir where I attended, and we did the Holy City. And they got so excited, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I'm just flying up and down the keyboard far faster than ever practiced before because the kids were so excited, my mother couldn't hold them back, and neither could I. So this was the first piece of something other than my piano lesson which I loved, and I hated my piano lessons at that time. But that's another story. So this, um, from the African Methodist Episcopal Review of about that time, there is a story of an opera singer who is singing this in his cell while a group of men are being tried for their crimes in the courtroom. And I guess the men had had a drunken spree the night before, and the opera star is singing, Last night I lay a-sleeping, I dreamed a dream so fair, and the story as you, as you well know. So in the courtroom, the story goes that the men drop to their knees in the courtroom when hearing the text, which compares to their drunken antics of the night before. Evidently, in the story, the judge pardoned them all, and he dismissed the cases without punishment, figuring they had learned a lesson from the song. So The Holy City by Stephen Adam. <laughs>
organ work is the Adagio in E major by Frank Bridge. This was in an early Romantic style before World War I. It's actually, I found out in my research, it's a four-voice fugue. You hear the melody come in on the third manual on the swell. Second manual comes in and join, second melody comes in and joins it. It changes manuals and gets louder. And you hear that same theme intertwined through all of this. And it builds to the full sound of the English organ, which is big and full and kind of fat and somewhat brilliant. Benjamin Britten, who many of you may have heard of, was his only composition student. I learned this when I was in high school, and I played at it for a number of years. I must say I think I do play it better and with much more understanding now. Please enjoy the Adagio in E major by Frank Bridge.
Our last work today is the Hallelujah Chorus with the D trumpet. Um, this comes from the end of part two of Messiah. Originally, it's for orchestra, choir, and trumpet. Many people wonder why people stand for the performance of this, and I would say right now, if you're listening online, you don't have to stand. Nobody will ever see you. I have been in a ch my first church where I was gainfully employed. We did the Hallelujah Chorus, and there were some who said this was a liturgical piece, we should not stand. Others said the King George II stood, so we're going to stand. So part of the congregation stood, and part of them sat, and I guess they got along all right. The story is that when King George II heard this piece in performance, that he stood, so everybody else did. However, further research has shown that George II may never have been at that program. We'll probably never know. But if you feel that you want to stand, do so. If you'd like to sit up straight and tall and listen to the Hallelujah Chorus by Handel, played by Jerry on his D trumpet, may the Lord bless you. Thank you for tuning in today, and we look forward to, to being in touch next month. God bless you all. Thank you.